Welcome to the next episode of General Relativity. I'm your host, Rifat Bari, graduate student at Brown University. Today, this is what we're going to be doing. We're going to be showing you how any differential form df can be expressed as a linear combination of the basis dual vectors dx and dy. Let's jump right in. Now, before we actually dive into the math, let me show you what we're going to do. We're starting with some scalar fields f. And then we're going to apply the differential operator D to get a covector field DF. That covector field is composed of contour sets, these contour sets. And then here's what we're going to do. This is a scalar field. We convert it into a covector field by applying the differential operator. The next thing we're going to do is consider the basis vectors, E sub X and E sub Y. Remember that those basis vectors can be expressed as partial derivatives as partial partial x and partial partial y. Now here's where the kicker comes in. What is the number of contour lines that E sub x trespasses? In other words, what is our covector field df applied to E sub x? That's going to help us answer how many contour lines E sub x crosses. Now E sub x, of course, is partial partial x. So that means d, sub f, d of f, the covector field applied to our basis vector is simply this partial derivative, partial f, partial x. Similarly, if I want to know how many contour lines does E sub y, my basis vector in the y direction pierce, how many contour lines does this pierce, I can simply do the same thing. Apply my covector field df to E sub y, E sub y is partial partial y, I get the partial derivative partial f partial y. And so that tells me that I can express partial derivatives in a new kind of way as covectors acting on basis vectors. And so then the next thing we're going to do is consider the following. Our ultimate goal is just like we were able to express a given covector alpha, an individual covector alpha, as a linear combination, alpha sub 1, alpha sub 2, of these basis vectors e to the 1 and e to the 2, we'll be able to express by the end of this episode any differential form df as a linear combination of dx and dy. These are called your dual basis vectors, d sub x and dx and dy. So to get started, we consider the following. Consider the scalar fields associated with a variable x. In that scalar field, x is negative to the left, 0 in the middle, and positive to the right. Applying my differential operator d, I obtain this kind of a covector field with vertical contour lines that are increasing to the right. I draw my vector bases, e sub x and e sub y, and check it out. How many field lines does e sub y pierce on this graph? Well, zero, right? Well, if I apply dx, my covector field associated with x to e sub y, then I get dx partial partial y, which is simply partial x partial y, which is zero, which is the number of contour lines e sub y pierces. There you go. Isn't that intuitive? And same idea for e sub x. How many field lines does e sub x pierce on the dx covector field? Well, just one, right? Just one over here. So how can we express that quantitatively? Well, apply the covector field dx to our basis vector e sub x, expand e sub x as the partial derivative, and partial x partial x is just one. In the last episode, we saw how applying the differential operator d to a scalar field can convert it into a covector field. Enough words, let me show you what I mean. This right here is the scalar field F. And now after I apply the differential operator D, here's how it looks like. As you can see, now this scalar field has become a covector field with not functions or scalar functions. It's now fields of contour level sets. This is our covector field, covector field. Now, the subject of today's discussion is going to be to show that any given covector field can be broken up into a linear combination of dual basis vectors. So what do I mean by that? Well, remember that we looked previously at alpha, a given covector. For example, if we have a covector field that looks like this, alpha, we can break that up into a linear combination of alpha sub 1 of a given basis covector epsilon to the 1 plus 
alpha sub 2 of another basis covector, epsilon to the 2. And these covectors increase in some direction. They have some origin. And likewise with these basis vectors. And so that is the big idea of what we did previously. We saw that any given covector, any given individual covector, alpha, could be broken up into a linear combination of this much, alpha sub 1, of epsilon to the 1, and this much, alpha sub 2, of epsilon to the 2. Now, in the last lecture, we took a look at differential forms, which are kind of like covectors, but covectors are different everywhere. So, for example, we looked at a kind of a contour level set that looked like the following. This is how a differential form, df, looks like. On a differential form, the covectors are different everywhere on the, on the covector field. So for example, at this point, the covector looks like this. At this point, the covector looks like this. Here, the covector looks like this, and so on and so forth. So we can apply the same principle of linear combinations to covector fields. In other words, we can break these up into a linear combination of partial f, partial x times a covector dual basis vector. So this is how that looks like. Plus partial f, partial y of the dual basis vector corresponding to dy. So this is dy and this is dx. So the same basic principle applies. Just as we can write any given covector alpha as a linear combination of these basis covectors alpha sub epsilon to the 1 and epsilon to the 2, we can, uh, uh, we can represent any differential form df as a linear combination of dx and dy. So let's check out how to do that. So to start off our investigation of how we can break up a given differential form into these basis dual vectors, dx and dy, let's start off with our basis vectors, e sub x and e sub y. So let me write that here. e sub x, recall, is partial, partial x, and e sub y is partial, partial y. Now, how do these guys look like on this scalar field, on this covector field, df? Well, e sub x is, of course, like this. Here's your e sub x basis vector. Here's your e sub y basis vector. Now here's the key idea. When we ask the question, how many contour lines does our basis vector pierce, what we're really asking is, what is our covector field df applied to our basis vector e sub x? Now of course e sub x we can replace with partial partial x, so this becomes df applied to partial partial x. And so to figure out how many contour lines our basis vector pierces, this is simply partial f, partial x. And similarly, in the y direction, to figure out how many contour lines the y basis vector e sub y pierces, we apply our covector field df to the e sub y basis vector. And so that becomes df applied to partial, partial y, which of course becomes partial f, partial y. So now consider the scalar field x. So for example, here is how the scalar field for x looks like. Yes. So if we now apply our differential operator d, then the scalar field representing yes. x becomes the covector field dx. So that looks something like this. So the dx covector field looks like constant lines of x. So that'll look like these vertical lines that are increasing to the right. Now, let's draw in our vector bases. So our basis vector looks like e sub x to the right and e sub y going up. Now, once again, we ask the same question. How many contour lines does e sub x and e sub y pierce? In other words, what is d sub x, our covector field, applied to my vector bases e sub x? Well, of course, I can replace e sub x with the partial derivative, partial partial x. And what is that if not dx dx, or which is of course 1. And that makes sense because my basis vector e sub x just pierces one contour line, as it should. It's a unit basis vector. Similarly, I can ask the question, how many contour lines does my y basis vector pierce? In other words, what is my covector field dx applied to e sub y? Well, that's just dx 
of partial partial y, which is equal to partial x partial y, which is simply 0. And now we can apply the exact same reasoning to our y differential vector. Now let's apply a similar thought. Now let's apply a similar. Now let's do the same thing, but for the y basis vector. So here's what that looks like. Let's say we start with the scalar field for y, which looks as follows. This is for y. And for y, we start with negative values down here at the bottom. These are all negative values. And as I approach the middle, I get values that are close to 0. And as I go to the top, I get positive values. So this is positive, this is 0, and this is negative. Now, after I apply my differential operator d, what does the covector field for y look like? Well, it looks like horizontal contour lines. So those look like as follows. We have 1, 2, 3. And these increase as I go up. So this is the differential field. This is the differential covector field for dy. And now let me draw in the vector bases e sub x and e sub y. So here is e sub x on the dy covector field. And here, here is e sub y on the covector field. These are, of course, not drawn to scale, but it gives you the general idea. Now, the question is, how many contour lines does e sub x pierce? In other words, what is the covector field dy applied to e sub x? Well, that's simply replacing e sub x by my partial derivative, partial partial x. I obtain partial y partial x, which is, of course, 0. Now, how many lines does my y basis vector pierce? Well, it's going to be the same idea, but now in the different direction. I have d sub dy of e sub y. Replace e sub y with my partial derivative. So dy of partial partial y. And of course, what is this? If not, partial y partial y. And that's, of course, just 1. So now I've concluded all of my measurements, and now we can summarize our results as follows. What we just found out is if I apply a covector field partial f to the basis vector in the x direction, then I just get partial f partial x. Similarly, if I apply the covector field f to partial partial y, the vector in the y direction, then I get partial f partial y. Now, what if instead of having f as my scalar field, I have one of my differential basis forms, dx or dy. Well, in that case, I found the following. dx applied to partial partial x was simply dx, or rather partial x partial x, which was 1. And applying the dx covector field to partial partial y, that was simply partial x partial y, which is 0. Similarly, if I applied the dy basis covector to the x basis, then I got partial y partial x, which is 0. And if I applied my dy covector field to partial partial y, then I got partial y partial y, which was 1. So to summarize my results, I can use Einstein summation convention. I can say that if I have dc to the i, where ci is one of my Cartesian coordinates, of partial partial c sub j, then I have partial ci, partial cj, which turns out to be the chronic or delta of i and j. So what's the consequence of these rules right here? Well, remember back to when we had those special covector bases, epsilon 1, such that when we applied them to some vector e sub 1, we got 1. But when we applied epsilon 1 to e sub 2, we would get 0. And similarly, when we applied epsilon 2 to e sub 1, we'd get 0. But epsilon 2 applied to e sub 2 would give 1. So we'd have the same rule, chronic or delta kind of rule, describing this kind of a dynamic, where epsilon to the i applied to e sub j gives us delta i j. So remember how we were able to use these special covector bases epsilon to express any given covector alpha which could be some arbitrary covector field, we could use these epsilons to express alpha, any given covector, as a linear combination of alpha sub 1 of epsilon sub 1, which looks something like this. So now that means we can do the exact same thing, but instead of using these special 
epsilon covector bases, we can use our dx and dy. We can use these differential forms right here to express any given differential form df in terms of a linear combination of dx and dy. So let's go ahead and do just that. So to summarize, just as we were able to express any covector alpha as a linear combination of epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, we can now express any differential form, any differential form, for example, the kind of differential form we saw just a few minutes ago, call this df, can be expressed as a linear combination of dx and dy, which increase to the right and vertically, respectively. And similarly, these increase to the right and vertically. And what, before I reveal what the coefficients are, we actually don't know what these coefficients are just yet, do we? We have to figure out how much of dx, a, and how much of dy, b, we have to combine to get the re desired covector field, df. So let's figure that out. To figure that out, what we need to do is just recall a simple fact. If we have a derivative, for example, df d lambda, then we can break it up into the covector field df applied to the basis vector in the y direction or some arbitrary vector partial partial lambda. How can I interpret this? Let's say you have some kind of a scalar field f of x comma y. So here is our Cartesian coordinate plane and we have some kind of a field here, some kind of a scalar field. So that scalar field might be a temperature distribution, it could be some kind of a field that has a value at each point on the Cartesian plane. Now, what if we have some kind of a path on our field? And that path is parameterized by the variable lambda. Now, if we had some tangent vector to this path, that tangent vector is partial partial lambda, and we wanted to know how much our function f changed along this path, then we would have to evaluate df d lambda. Now, df d lambda evaluated is the same thing as taking the covector field associated with this scalar field. So if I applied my differential operator d, I might get some kind of a covector field associated with this scalar field. And once I get my covector field, I'm going to apply it to this vector, partial partial lambda, which is the e sub lambda vector. And that is going to tell me what my functions changes along this path. In other words, I can interchange these two expressions. The partial derivative or the full derivative of my function with respect to lambda is interchangeable with this covector interpretation of the partial derivative. Let's go ahead and do the math. If we have df d lambda and we choose to express it as a linear combination of Cartesian coordinates, so partial f partial x, partial x partial lambda, plus partial f, partial y, partial y, partial lambda, then our next step is going to be to exploit this fact that these two expressions are interchangeable to rewrite this partial derivative as the covector dx applied to the vector partial partial lambda, the covector dy applied to the vector partial partial lambda. And of course, I have my coefficients as usual, partial f, partial y, and partial f, partial x. So now what I'm going to do is, this here is the full derivative, df d lambda. Notice that I have this partial partial lambda on both sides, and these operators are both acting on this derivative right here, partial partial lambda. So I'm going to go ahead and factor out this derivative which gives me the following. So once I factor out my operator, I obtain this, partial f partial x times dx plus partial f partial y times dy applied to my vector partial partial lambda. Now, I'm going to rewrite the left-hand side as my covector field df acting on partial partial y, partial partial lambda, my vector, and that's equal to this whole thing, 
partial f partial x dx plus partial f partial y dy acting on partial partial lambda. And so that tells me the following. Looking at the left and right hand sides and comparing, I can tell that these two operators must be the same because they're acting on the same vector, right? In other words, df, the total change in my function is equal to partial f partial x dx plus partial f partial y dy. And that, of course, is simply the multivariable chain rule. So that tells me the coefficient next to dx is simply the derivative of my function with respect to x. Likewise, the coefficient next to y is just the derivative of my function with respect to y. And so that tells us that if we have some differential field df that looks like some kind of an arbitrary covector field, this is df, then we can break it up into partial f partial x of dx, which looks like this as a covector field, and plus partial f partial y of dy, which looks like this as a covector field. And so now we have expressed our covector, our differential form df. This is our differential form as a linear combination of dx and dy. So dx and dy here are referred to as our dual basis vectors.